All right, so it's vital to understand what the breakdown is. So many people feel like the court system is stacked against you. And in a way, it kind of is. And, and the reason why I'm going to tell you that is because it's not built to get punitive damages for you if a person's been a narcissist. That's not its job. Its job, especially you know, if you're in a divorce situation, is to divide assets or to give people their kids, give people time with their kids. That's the job. Or, you know, if there's a, a spousal support claim, then okay. Even if it's a business dispute, it, maybe it's a probate litigation claim, or maybe it's something else, right? Defamation, whatever, whatever it is. The job of the judge is to apply the law agnostically to go, okay, what statute applies here? And let me see how it's been interpreted by case law and move on. And you've got a judge who more than likely has way too many cases on their docket and more than likely has heard everybody on their and their brother and sister and you know on the whole freaking planet at this point everyone's a narcissist now. So they don't want to hear about that. That's on one side of it. And and by the way, judges are overworked, underpaid, maybe highly esteemed sort of, you know, at this point, I don't even know. They're government workers. That's what they are. They get paid the same regardless of what you decide to do. They're not getting paid more. There's no bonus involved. They do get evaluated based on how quickly they get cases off their docket or how often they get appealed. If they are appealed too often or things happen, you know, they're not going to get reelected or reappointed, you know, depending on how it is that they got that position in the first place. They're not lifetime appointees like the Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court, right? If they're looking to stay in that job for a long period of time, then they may just choose the safe route. There's a lot at play politically for the judge as well. So you got to think about that. That's one side of the equation. So, you know, they might just take the safe route and go, you know, it's easier for me to just see what's going on here. Okay, apply. The other side of it is from your perspective, let's say it's a divorce situation, what you may be coming into this as, hey, I got married for life. And I expected that this was going to be my life. I signed up to be married to a person who I thought was going to be the love bomb version. And they turned out to be the devil from hell, the worst possible thing ever. And I didn't expect that. And somebody's got to pay. Somebody's got to make up for this to me. I want somebody to help me. And so there's this disconnect here. And so, you know, you may be going, hey, somebody's got to make this up to me. Well, you can't look to the judge to do that because the judge's job, that's not the judge's job. So what you need to do is figure out how you're going to present this to the judge, to the court in a way that they're going to care. Because if you don't, then that's where you fall short. From a divorce perspective, there's something else that is really important for you to understand. And that is that there is a big, huge myth out there. And that is that no fault means that fault never matters. And that is flatly wrong because no fault just means that you don't have to prove fault in order to get a divorce. In the old days, you had to prove grounds like abuse or adultery. Nowadays, you don't. You just have to say that the marriage is irretrievably broken or something like that. But fault matters all the time. You can say that somebody has been a, a horrible parent. You can say that somebody's wasted assets. You can say that somebody's been a liar, and then that will be taken into consideration depending on what the statute provides. And that's where you look at the terms of your statute. 
And that's when you start speaking the language of the court. And that's how you get the judge to care. Does this make sense? If this makes sense, give me a yes in the comments. This is where you build your connection between what you care about and what the judge is going to care about. Now, how are you going to do this? You can't obviously just come in and say the things that you want to say because then it's just your word against the other person's word. You've got to have proof. What's your proof? Your proof is going to be in your documentation. Your documentation is going to be your detailed records. It could be emails. It could be texts. It could be witnesses. It could be videos. There's a number of different things it could be but you wanna keep detailed records of everything, all interactions with that narcissist, dates, times, specific. It could be voicemails, anything that demonstrates their behavior. I've had people keep meticulous records and then those things end up being summaries. You can keep timelines. Timelines end up being beautiful. You think that you have it in your head, but when you start laying it out and you start to see what it is on paper or on your screen or whatever it is nowadays, you will get to see patterns. It is those patterns that end up being the gold for you because they never think that you're going to keep track. When they say, hey, I'm Mr. Dad, I'm Mr. Dad. And then when they ask for a change in the schedule, 50% of the time in a four month period, it becomes gold. But you've got to document it. You document behavior and that, or you have coworkers, or you have piano teachers, or you have whoever it is that helps you because it paints a comprehensive picture of the environment of the community, of everything that's been going on. Because you gotta understand, the judge walks out, they don't know you. And a lot of times, all they see is the reaction from you. Because you know what they do. They bait you, they trigger you, and then the narcissist goes, oh, there's the crazy one over there, see? I'm the calm, wonderful one. You see that I'm, I'm the one who is nice and wonderful, Your Honor. And the way they do it is just so manipulative and you know that, right? So you have to establish patterns of behavior. The other way that you can do it, if you can afford it, is bringing in experts, third-party neutral experts for forensics. It could be a custody evaluation. It could be for a lifestyle analysis, for income or purposes of support. It could be for business valuations. But the more that you can have those third-party neutral evaluators, the better it is. You better make sure it's somebody that you're gonna trust who's gonna do a good job. I'm always really careful about that. Oftentimes, I also like to use technology to my advantage, digital communications, you know, keep things in real time. It's really, really helpful. If you think you're gonna go back and recreate you know, it's just not helpful. You want to stay organized in real time. Have an organizer for your cases. Have an organizer for your timeline. I would have a coach. I train coaches. I have coaches that are available to help you. I have my programs to help you. I have all kinds of a suite of resources for you. If you want a resource to get you started that's free, Go to my free Crush My Negotiation Prep Playbook at winmynegotiation.com. It's a great place to get you started. Also, my free Facebook group, Narcissist Negotiators with Rebecca Zung, get you started there. You definitely want to have a suite of tools, resources, people who are going to support you because obviously they're going to gaslight you. They're going to light you up with litigation. They're going to ignore your court orders. They're going to ignore your attempts to get discovery. I mean, I would definitely use subpoenas where you can because they're going to give you half replies and they're going to make you work for everything. Make it as expensive as possible and, and then make sure it's your fault. 
I mean, you know, everything's going to be a, a, a thing. And you want to have a good lawyer not to rely, overly rely on because you just want to use a good lawyer for just the parts that you need, which is just present the law, present the case. Everything else you want to organize. You want to be driving the bus. You want to know what you're doing. That's where I come in to help you with that through my program because I'm here to help you save your money put it in your pocket. So proving narcissistic abuse can be daunting, but not really because they are very simple to understand. They're, they're simple creatures to understand. They're difficult to deal with, but they're simple to understand. So remember you're not alone. Don't, don't try to do this alone. That's how you can prove narcissistic abuse. I have helped people win. They only win if you give it. You absolutely can do this. You have to believe it. You must believe that you can do it. That's how you, you start. If you think you're going to give up and you think that you're going to lose, they have you. The minute that you think that, they have you. So don't give them that satisfaction. Now you're dealing with a narcissist in a court setting and you're feeling like they just always get their way. I've dealt with it so many times where people will come into my office, even in the beginning of a case and say, I think that they're going to fool everyone because the person who's the narcissist is going to win, is going to uh, get everybody to believe that they're wonderful and I'm horrible. And and narcissists do start their smear campaigns in that deep, in, in that discard phase. And if you want to know more about what the signs are of a smear campaign, definitely check out my video on signs of a narcissist smear campaign. But once that smear, smear campaign starts, they, they're, they're in this mode of trying to make sure that you're the one that looks bad and they're the one that looks good. So they're going to be kind of love bombing everybody in the system, including the judges, including your, the, you know, their lawyer, your lawyer even. And, and, and if there's a, a custody evaluator involved, you know, they're going to be love bombing that person. And they're going to be trying to make you look like you're the bad one. So they may be filing bogus motions. They may be calling you an abuser, you know, really horrible things. I've seen, you know, really good parents be the victim of the other pa parent saying that parent is an abuser or that parent is unfit or that parent is a drug addict or something like that. And you're sitting there thinking, I'm like having coffee in my house. I don't really know. But uh, the, the, they start that and they, they not only say it to people sometimes, they actually even put it in pleadings. You know, you'll actually see a motion or something that is filled with lies. And you think, how are they getting away with this? How are they getting away with this? I can't tell you how many clients I've, I've heard say to me, how are they getting away with this? Well, let me just first address that. The one thing that you have to remember is that the only person who has any power to order somebody to do something is the judge, no one else. You know, I actually had a client say to me, you've done nothing to control him and his behavior. And I, re I remember thinking, what would I do other than file motions? Because that's the power that your, your lawyer has is to file something with the court but remember, when something is filed with the court, it just sits there in the clerk's file, doesn't do anything until a hearing is actually had. Because those filings are, for the most part, not evidence that can be accepted into the court system, actually in a hearing setting. So once that motion is filed, then you can go in front of a judge. And that's how you can start exposing the narcissist in court. How do you do it? You do it by not actually saying the person is a narcissist. Don't use the word narcissist in court. I actually have a whole video on that. Make sure you check that out on whether you can even use the word narcissist in court. But what you're going to do is you're going to actually have um, 
other ways that you can expose this narcissist for their behavior. And you do that very systematically. There's no magic wand. There's no go buy this thing and that's going to be the thing uh, other than the SLAY program because the SLAY program will show you how to do that. But what you're going to be doing is creating documentation and exhibits that actually systematically show that that person is a bad person. And you want to do it in light of the statutes, in light of something that the judge is going to care about. Because remember, the judge has to apply the law. That's the judge's job. So what a judge will do is they'll listen to that side, they'll listen to this side, but remember, they just get a little teeny snapshot. You might have been dealing with this person for 15 or 20 years. You get like a couple of hours in front of a judge to expose this person. So you wanna make sure it's good. You wanna make sure that it packs a punch. So you're gonna create summaries, for example, of when the person lied and then have all your supporting documentation attached to it or create summaries of when they um, didn't pick up the kids or didn't show up on time or or bad mouthed you, you know, something like that because but you're going to do it in in light of the statute. So if the stat if the best interest of the child statute says that parents are supposed to foster a close and continuing relationship between the children and the other parent and you've got tons of text messages where they're saying to the the kids that you know the other parent is a, an alcoholic or a, you know neglectful doesn't want you or something like that those become wonderful trial exhibits. So, you know, you're actually giving the judge something that they can hold on to, that they can use when they're applying that law that actually gives you the results that you actually want. Um, just going in and saying that person is a narcissist isn't gonna get you anywhere. So that's not how you expose them. You expose them by actually doing your homework, which a lot of that, I have a 45 page workbook in the SLAY program, so you should definitely check that out. But that, that's how you're ultimately going to expose them by systematically using the information that you have and putting it together in light of the statutes that the judge is actually going to care about. That's how you will expose them. And if you are so ready to expose that narcissist in court, give me it. Expose the truth in the comments. So remember that narcissists feed off of narcissistic supply. And one of the things that they're gonna do is, um, is try to get all the judges and everybody to love them. So what you, what you wanna do is create leverage by figuring out which person in the system they're gonna um, respect the most, which is probably the judge, and then create leverage, which is going to um, potentially threaten to expose them for who they are. So, and, and if you wanna more, know more about leverage, definitely check out my video on creating leverage. But that's gonna be one of the whole keys to this whole thing. That's the L in my SLAY program. So S, S is strategy and L is leverage. So you, you, you want to create this leverage that's going to threaten to expose them and that way um, they potentially might even settle. And I know a lot of people think, oh, nobody ever settles with a narcissist. You can never get them to settle, but that is so not true. If you threaten a supply source that's more important for them to keep than the supply that they get from jerking you around in the system, you will be able to resolve your case. Americans spend up to 90% of their time indoors and take 20,000 breaths a day Yet, according to the EPA, indoor air is actually more polluted than outdoor air. And in fact, 100 times more polluted than outdoor air. In fact, it's responsible for up to 7 million premature deaths annually. And I know for us, we have had issues with asthma. My daughter has struggled with asthma. And that's why we were so excited to find Air Doctor. Air Doctor has captured the attention of 
huge media outlets such as CNN, Money, ABC, and more. And it filters out 99.9% .9 of dangerous contaminants and allergens such as pollen, pet dander, dust mites, and mold, and even bacteria and viruses. So your lungs don't have to do all of that extra work. So right now, Air Doctor also comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you don't love it, you just send it back for a refund minus shipping. So head to airdoctorpro.com and use the promo code your best life and depending on the model you receive up to 39 percent off and up to 300 dollars off exclusive to podcast customers you'll also receive a three-year warranty on any unit which is an additional 84 dollars value lock in this special offer by going to air d-o-c-t-o-r pro.com and use the promo code your best life okay so you are going to court with a narcissist and you're thinking i can't win or they always seem to win or they always get their way or everybody seems to be duped by them or the court system is unfair i know i've heard all of the things believe me i know because i've been around the court system for a long time. I've practiced law for a long time. I've been around the system for a long time. I've been in trials many, many times, hearings many, many times. I've seen all different shapes and sizes of clients, judges, all different types of opposing counsel, magistrates, all different types of proceedings. So I know what it's like. Okay, I've had narcissists as clients, unfortunately, I've had them uh, as opposing counsel. And here's the thing that I know, that is that if you go into this situation thinking this court system is skewed, everybody's against me, the narcissist always wins, you will definitely lose. If you want to win your case, then you have to, first of all, have a mindset that you're going to win. And by the way, I'm Rebecca Song. I've been recognized by U.S. News as one of the best lawyers in America. And I've won a lot of other awards, too. And if you're new here, welcome. I'm glad that you're here. I've also written a best-selling book, Slay the Bully, How to Negotiate with a Narcissist and Win. And I invite you to subscribe here and join us in this amazing and powerful community, okay? Let me tell you, I know it doesn't seem fair a lot of the time. And you know, there's a lot of different reasons for that. The biggest reason is that you're kind of speaking different languages because you're kind of looking to the court system to right a wrong because you had an idea in mind of what you thought life was going to be whether it was with a person you were married to, or maybe it was a business situation, or maybe it was a probate situation, whatever it was. And so you're looking to the court system to right this wrong for you and make it fair, make it equitable. That's really not quite the job of the court system. The court system's job is to apply the law. And the law, it's like agnostic. For example, if it's a divorce situation, the law might say something like split the assets, make sure the kids get to see their parents, you know, so that there's some kind of a plan in place that's in the best interest of the child, children or child. And in most states, that might be 50-50 nowadays. Let's see, let's make sure that the parents have some kind of decision-making authority around big-time decisions like medical or education. And let's make sure that the parents pay for things for the kids, like extracurricular activities or something to that effect. It's not like Let's make sure that we make Susie whole for the promises that Johnny might have made to her 20 years ago. Now Johnny turned into, she found out that Johnny's an asshole. And so let's make her feel whole about that. It's not the, jo the court's job. And so there's kind of like a disconnect about that. 
because there's like this emotional aspect of things, right? You also have kind of like this other agenda going on here because the judge who presides over the court system, they have their own thing going on, which is most of the time they're overworked, underpaid. They are basically a government employee, if you think about it. They have way too many cases on their docket. They are evaluated, if you think about it, okay? They are evaluated. They are evaluated in terms of if they get appealed, are those appeals successful? And also they are evaluated on how many cases are on their docket and how quickly they move and are they getting backed up and all that sort of thing. They are not supposed to have these cases back up on their docket. And that's why you have things like case management conferences. You know, they're looking at, hey, this case has been languishing for a while. And what do we need to do to get this case moving? Because we don't want this case to be open for too long. They're looking at things like that to make sure that the case is closed. What, what can we do to make sure that this case is going to be moved along? So what they're going to do is they're going to go, hey, do we need discovery on this case? Okay, let's make a deadline. Hey, do we need to set depositions on this case? All right, let's make a deadline. So they're going to make sure of that. So all that the, the judge cares about is that. They're not going to go, how can we help Susie with her plight about the fact that she got ripped off from the life that she was promised by Johnny? They don't care about that. And in fact, if it's a divorce situation or a custody situation, and it's a family court situation, let's say, or even probably a probate situation at this point, everybody has been using that term narcissist at this point. You're gonna get the eye roll, you're gonna get the proverbial eye roll if you try to use the term narcissist. Everybody uses those words. So what I'm gonna say to you is that you're gonna have to use other ways, other methods to expose this person in court. You're going to have to speak the language of the judge. What I would say to you is you're going to want to speak the language prior to that, because in my opinion, I would say to you, get to that narcissist before you even get to the judge. So in my slay method, which is what I teach in my courses and my certification, which is to help you so you can save money, save time, save headache, so that you can actually get what you want from these people. What you do is you actually get to them before you do that. You create leverage. But the best way you're going to do this is you want to get to them by hurt, getting them where it's going to hurt. All right. So you want to create leverage such that you are threatening a source of supply that's more important for them to keep than the supply that they get from manipulating you. So what is that? That is diamond level supply. So diamond level supply is their reputation. It's what is more important to them than anything, how they look to the world, right? So what's their diamond level supply? It's probably a number of things, but it's most likely, you know, people that they work with or their bosses. It could be their fans, if they're a celebrity, or it could be their children. If, they're, if they have adult children, it's definitely the judge in the, in the case. So it could be a number of sources. Who do they not want to look bad in front of? It could be neighbors. It could be friends, high-end friends or whatever. But it's who do they not want to look bad in front of? Then the next thing is coal level supply, which is you, which is manipulating you, getting that supply source from you. And then the next thing you want to do is take all of that and put it in terms that the judge, the court, is going to care about. What do they care about? They care about case law. They care about statutes. They care about the law. So you want to take your laws, your statutes, the law in your 
state, your jurisdiction, your country, wherever it is that you're watching me hear from, take your facts and, and, and apply it to your law. How do you do that? So what I suggest that you do, and I teach all of this in my Slay course, by the way, which you can learn more about at slayyournegotiation.com, or I, I'm going to give you some free, free stuff here in a minute. You can start with free winmynegotiation.com. You can get a free crush my negotiation playbook at winmynegotiation.com. It's totally free. It's 15 pages. It'll totally help you. What you want to do is you're going to take your statutes, your case law, and you're going to create an, a, a binder or something, and you're going to take each one of the prongs of your statute, let's say it's the best interest of the, of the children's statute, each one of those, that statute has, you know, maybe 10 different factors, 17 different factors, whatever it is, and let's say one of them is which parent is more likely to foster a close and continuing relationship with the other parent. Let's say there's a text message that says, oh, you know, mommy is a terrible parent or daddy is whatever. Then you take that text and you put that in that section of the binder. And now you are building your case. Now you can have summaries. Now you can have summaries of lies, summaries of inconsistency, whatever. And, and, now you are starting to put it in terms of that statute, put it in terms of that law. And so now you're going to start speaking the language that the judge will understand. Understand? Get it? You get it? I want you to put I get it in the comments below. So you want to understand the mindset of that judge. It can be a huge game changer when you are dealing with that narcissist, okay? Documentation is key. I have had entire coaches, coaches who've done my entire program, who've actually created their own apps, all kinds of really cool stuff because they have won. I had one of my coaches say, he came up with his own phrase, which is, it's their word against your documentation, right? So when you understand how to do this, it's gold. You, you can't lose. It wins every single time. I've helped literally thousands of people all over the world in over 100 countries. It works. You take your patterns, you take your summaries, and it becomes all kinds of magical things for you. And it becomes so influential, and you don't even know what ends up coming from it. So in my program... I show you how to do it. I give you timelines. I give you templates, all kinds of really cool stuff. But start with the free. Start with winmynegotiation.com and you'll get super far with it. I am a seasoned attorney. I have dealt with narcissists in court a lot of times. I've litigated against them for more than two decades. I know I started when I was five, right? But I want to make sure that you know what not to do or you will lose against that narcissist. So grab your pen, grab your paper, sit up and take a listen because I know what you want to make sure that you don't do so that you don't lose or you don't end up spending years that you don't want to spend. You want to get your life back. You want to get your power back. You don't want to spend tons and tons of money that you either don't have or you'd rather not spend on a, a narcissist, right? They're trying to get all this supply out of you. They're trying to make your life miserable. You want to have your life back. You want to be able to breathe again. You want to be able to spend time with your kids or spend time in your business or just do anything other than this. Here's what I'm going to tell you. I'm going to give you five things not to do so that you don't lose against that narcissist. I'm Rebecca Zung. I have been recognized by U.S. News as one of the best lawyers in America. I have a best-selling book, the USA Today bestseller, Slay the Bully, How to Negotiate with a Narcissist and Win. If you're new here, make sure that you subscribe, hit that notification bell. I also have a freebie for you, which you can get at winmynegotiation.com. Make sure you get that. That's my free Crush My Negotiation Prep playbook. Make sure you get that. 
All right, so going to court against a narcissist is super challenging. Why? Because they never want to let you go. It's not just winning that they want. They want to be able to make your life miserable. That's that coal level supply. I call it coal level supply. Diamond level supply is just how they look to the world. But they want to keep you going. It's that sadistic piece. Things can turn really fast if you're not prepared. So here are five crucial mistakes that you must avoid to ensure you don't lose, right? So number one, number one is avoiding emotional outbursts. And this is in person. It also is in writing. So remember, anything you put your hand to is a potential trial exhibit, and they're going to bait you in every possible way. They're going to try to pull you in, suck you in, drag you in, in every way that they can. So you got to be super careful about this because if it's a custody thing, they're going to say, you're a deadbeat dad, you're a horrible mom, you starve the kids, you didn't give them the right meal, You did whatever it is. They're going to try to paint you as unstable, unfit. They're going to provoke you as much as they can to try to trigger a reaction out of you. You can't go there, okay? If it's a workplace situation, if it's a boss, they're going to try to directly confront you. They're going to subtly dig you. They're going to bring up all kinds of painful things. They're going to smear you to other people, everything they can to make you look unprofessional. That's what they do. Okay, so just expect it. Don't be like, oh my God, I can't believe they did that. Go, oh, oh well, there they go, being a narcissist again. Okay, that's what you have to do. So you have to document, you have to write things down, you have to take pictures, you have to keep a correspondence, keep your text messages, keep everything so that you know, oh, there you go. Thank you for the gift. Thank you for letting me know that that's what you're going to be and keep track of it all. Keep a timeline. That's what I help you do. That's number one. Number two is don't react. Don't react to the provocation. When they act like that, just be like that gray rock. When they provoke you in these situations and they do their, their digs, they spread the false information, which you're going to be expecting them to do, right? I remember I had a client say, called me up, can you believe he did this? Can you believe he did that? Can you? And I said, yes. Yes, of course I can believe it. What I can't believe is that you can't believe it because remember... You've been telling me this for years that this is how he's been. So just expect it and just be gray rock. Mm, no, really? Oh, yes. Mm, oh, interesting. Short little responses. You don't react because any reaction strengthens their position. It gives them that fuel that they need. They are addicts. Remember, they are basically addicts are looking for that hit that's what they're looking for don't give it to them anytime you become visibly upset you start retaliating okay now we're in it now you're there that's what they want don't go there so that's number two number three is do not rely solely on your word. Don't go into anything, any court proceeding, any mediation, any negotiation, thinking that your word is going to be worth anything because narcissists are going to be very good at painting a picture that is different and they will fashion something that sounds very plausible and you better have solid proof to back up what your position is that's why documentation is key so if you're accusing them of abusive behavior make sure you have text messages emails witness statements timelines Without concrete proof, 
It's just your word against theirs. And you want to have all kinds of evidence that shows that what you're saying is the truth. If it's a workplace situation, performance reviews, emails, witness testimonies, anything that's going to support your claim because relying on your account is not going to be enough to just to sway a court. That's for sure. So if, if these tips are resonating with you so far, I want to know and, you know, give this video a, a good on, thumbs up and I'd love to hear from you. I want to hear yes in the comments. Give me a yes. Put yes in the comments. I want you to let me know what your thoughts and experiences are in the in the comments below as well. I want to remind you that I have this free crush my negotiation prep playbook. Grab that at winmynegotiation.com because I want you to have something tangible that you can use to help yourself. All right, so number four is do not let the narcissist know what you're up to. Don't show your strategy. Don't show your leverage. You know, I always say it's wise to use the element of surprise when you are dealing with a narcissist. It's wise to use the element of surprise. Narcissists are so skilled at finding your weaknesses and exploiting them. They will go for that vein. They will find that Achilles heel. They will look for your little place. And if you show at all what your cards are, they're going to find a way to attack it and bring it down. They will find a way to take your strategy and reframe it, take that narrative, take it and make it, make it their own. Every single thing that you say will be taken out of context and reframed. So be very careful. They will always find a way to counteract it and turn it against you. And they're very good at making everybody think, believe their story. So do not show your strategy or your leverage until you are ready and they are completely pinned in and that you have so much evidence against them that there's nowhere for them to run or hide. You don't want to discuss your legal strategy, even with mutual acquaintances, nothing on social media. They will use everything they can to their advantage. They are in constant survival mode, these people. And they will manipulate every situation in their favor. Okay. So be very, very careful business situation, a workplace situation. You have to maintain confidentiality. It is crucial. Don't trust anybody because any little leak, they're going to exploit it and undermine your situation. Number five, you ready for number five? Number five is do not expect fairness. You have to go on the offensive. No one is coming. There are no narc police in this world. No one's going to jump out in your living room at your workplace and go, hey, you can't do that. That's not fair. Narcissists play dirty and they'll do whatever it takes to win. That's what they do expecting them to act with fairness or act with integrity is a mistake. What comes out of their mouth is a lie. If they say, I just want what's fair. I don't want to, let's do this the nice way. That's going to be crap. Okay. So, and it's going to cost you. So in, in divorce proceedings, a narcissistic spouse is going to hide assets. They will lie under oath. They will manipulate children to gain an advantage. Be prepared. Expect these tactics. Gather evidence to counter them. If it's a workplace dispute, a narcissistic boss will fabricate evidence, bribe witnesses, use their influence to sway the outcome. Understanding this is going to help you tremendously because you will prepare. And then when you go to present, you can say, I expect that this is going to be your argument. And here's why your argument has no merit. And you, you can shoot it down 
before they even bring it up. So powerful. Making that transition between summer and fall is always a crazy thing. And that's why I love having a leather jacket, like my gorgeous one from Quince. And they have timeless and high quality items, which I love. And they don't blow my budget, which I also love. They have cashmere sweaters and washable silk tops. And everything is like 50 to 80% less than other brands, which I also love. They cut out the middleman. They pass the savings on to us, which is also amazing. It's safe and ethical, which I also love. I really love my brown leather jacket from them. It's super stylish and it's high quality. Just love that. So make switching seasons a breeze with Quince's high quality closet essentials Go to quince.com slash negotiate for free shipping on your order and 365 day returns. That's Q-U-I-N-C-E dot com slash negotiate to get free shipping and 365 day returns. Quince.com slash negotiate. I'm going to give you five ways to make sure that you beat a narcissist in court. So you're going to want to make sure you stay till the end. You're going to want to make sure that you save this video. You're going to want to make sure you share it out. You're going to want to make sure that you go ahead and watch it over and over again, because I'm going to give you all the ways to make sure that you beat a narcissist in court. Okay. So what you're going to want to do is you're going to remember the acronym, knock them dead. All right. So D E A D D. So two D's. But D E A D D, knock them dead. So the first D stands for document everything. And I mean everything. You know, you're going to want to journal everything. You're wanna, going to want to document everything. In my slave program, I actually have 12 different things that you're going to want to be documenting, but you're going to want to document everything with regard to finances, to your children, if you have children, anything that they do that seems out of the ordinary. I know it's a pain, but you know, if you have a notes app or something, just note it because you're not going to remember. But you know, even if it's crazy, oh, I don't know if I should write that down, but you know, you just never know. And there's many different ways that these things come into play. So you will want to make sure that you document everything, whether it's a business case or a family law case, or it's against a business partner. Maybe it's a, a case against an employer or something like that. It always is something that you're going to need to be doing is documenting. Whether it's a timeline form, you end up needing it for the statutes to prove different elements of a statute you definitely need documentation. I also have a podcast where I ended up interviewing one of the people who used my Slave for Biz program, Sharon Scott. I highly recommend that you check that out because she talked about how she used my program and it really helped her a lot. So definitely document everything. The next thing is the E, emotions. Keep them in check. You're definitely going to want to keep your emotions in check. There's so many different reasons that you want to keep your emotions in check. I mean, for one thing is that they want to trigger you constantly. They love to see you squirm. So they get supply from it. And you really don't want to give them narcissistic supply, obviously, because that's no fun. I mean, they just get the satisfaction of seeing you go crazy, right? I mean, why do you want to do that? But then the next thing is that they use your reaction against you. They go, look, there's the crazy one. There's the one that's the problem. And they will use that against you in a number of ways. They use the emails against you, the texts against you. They may even be videotaping against you. They use the witnesses against you, whatever it is. So definitely keep your emotions in check. They use it for custody, so many different things. So Definitely E, keep your emotions in check. And it doesn't help you when you're negotiating either if you're all over the place when it comes to settlements because then you end up settling for things that you regret two months down the road, three months down the road. You're like, oh, I didn't want to settle for that because a lot of times you're like, oh, I just, I just ended up settling for that because I just wanted it to be done. I just wanted it to be over with, or maybe you were just feeling pressured, you know, really try to keep your emotions in check. And by the way, if you're 
really, really struggling with that because a lot of times when you're, you've been dealing with a narcissist for a long period of time, you, you are in a trauma state, especially PTSD sometimes. I do have a partnership with BetterHelp. You can go to betterhelp.com forward slash Rebecca Zung. I do receive commissions on that. It doesn't cost you any more. We have a partnership with them because I wanted to have a partnership with a service that we could trust, that we could recommend. If you are struggling, go to betterhelp.com forward slash Rebecca Zung so that you can get the help and support that you need if you're having trouble with your emotions and you're having trouble with trauma. So that's the E. The next one is always wear the white hat. That's the A, always wear the white hat. And what do I mean by that? I mean by that in that you want to be the one if you end up in front of the judge, which that's what this is about. You want to be the one where the judge is like, hey, this is the person that obviously is the good one. Let the narcissist be the one who's the one who's badly behaving. A lot of times it's so easy to fall into, hey, they're behaving badly. They're doing things wrong. They did it too. I can do it too. What happens though is then you have a situation where the judge is just like seeing like two kids that are fighting. So for those of you who are, who are out there watching who have children and, and you have more than one, what happens is it, they just are like, oh, both of you just stop it. You know, they don't see that, oh, well, they started it or they're worse. They just see two people who just are fighting. So you want to be the one who's consistently not being in the mud with the other one. Because if you are the one who's what I call always wearing the white hat, who's not engaging, who didn't respond, who didn't get into it, and the other one is always the one who's constantly the badly behaved one, then it makes it really, really obvious who is the the bad one. And, and it's kind of hand in hand with keeping your emotions in check, but it's even one step much, much further than that. You really, really want to be the one who's just always behaving, always doing the right thing. So just kind of imagine that the judge is sort of walking around with you and watching every single thing that you're doing. Always wear the white hat. That's the A. All right. So the next one is don't go anywhere alone. That's the D, the first D in knock them dead. And we're going through all the elements of what to do to beat a narcissist in court. So, you know, this is because they're going to say you followed them, you, you did this, you did that. They lie all the time. So they're constantly going to be saying that you were menacing, that you were threatening, that you did this with the kids or that you touched somebody inappropriately or whatever it is that they make up constantly. And, and then you end up having to defend against these ridiculous claims. So you want to make sure that you have people around as much as you possibly can. If you have children, for example, have your exchanges for custody at daycares, at schools, you know, at shopping plazas or places where people are around because you just don't want situations where they can make things up about what's going on. And in that same vein, by the way, you're going to want to make sure that even depositions are videotaped if possible. And I have actually a whole video on how to be a narcissist in mediation. I talk about that in there and you should definitely check out that video as well, because a lot of you who are trying to beat a narcissist in court are also mediating with a narcissist and you should definitely check out that video as well. And I also do have a whole video where I interview Judge Lynn Toller. You guys should definitely check out that video too. 
She was the judge on divorce court for 17 years. And her video interview was very, very highly fascinating. So definitely check that out too. And if you guys are so ready to knock them dead, put knock them dead in the comments because I'm so ready to help you knock them dead. And if you've been following along with how to beat a narcissist in court and you've been following along with my acronym, you know, there's one more D. The last D is decoys. It stands for decoys. And what I mean by decoys is you really do not want to give them your best offer or give them any of your best evidence or show them any of your cards or show them any of your hands until you're ready to unveil it in court or when you're ready. I mean, a lot of times while you're standing on the courthouse steps or even at lunch during the trial, they want to settle they're ready to have settlement talks or even maybe the eve before trial or a couple of days before they're ready to have some settlement talks at that point or something and you might be ready at that point as well but you've got to have your strategy your leverage have anticipated your focus on you your position that being on the offensive my whole slay methodology at that point you do not give them your best offer you do not show your best evidence you decoy the whole thing until you are so ready to go basically the way i look at it is you're building an invisible fence around them until you turn on the lights and they realize, oh my God, I'm totally pinned in. At that point, they have no choice but to resolve the issue with you or resolve the issues with you. So you're appearing weak, you're feigning ignorance, you, you know, oh, I, I don't know, I have no idea. Let them think that they're winning let them go all crazy on you. Allow them to go off. A lot of times that's good for you. It's hard. I know because it's, you don't want them to get away with anything a lot of times during the case, but sometimes if you have an ongoing case, it's good to let them screw up because those little battles that show that they're screwing up help you to demonstrate to the judge who they actually are. So let them do that, you know, because then you can show patterns that they aren't doing what they're supposed to do, show patterns that they're liars, show patterns that they are bad parents or terrible with money or whatever it is that you need to show it actually ends up helping you in the end or that they have anger issues or whatever it is so that definitely helps you sometimes it's it's really really good to feign that you're weak feign that you're ignorant a lot of times by the way you you can pretend like there's a particular thing that you really really want and it's not the thing that you really really want because then, you know, they go after that, you know, because they're going to go after the thing that they think that you really, really want, right? So let them go after that particular thing. And I'm here to help you navigate those treacherous waters against narcissists so you can finally be free. Isn't that what you want? I know that's what I wanted. So it's time to be free, whether you're dealing with this in a divorce, in a professional setting, in a family setting, this is one of the things that they do. False out allegations, false accusations, they line up those flying monkeys and they make you feel like you're isolated. They make you feel like you're alone by smearing you. The first thing that you need to do is stay calm, put this invisible shield down around you and start seeing them as if they are a toddler having a tantrum on the floor because that's basically what they are they're big babies and they're just going to scream louder and they're going to scream longer and until they finally give up they are the worst right before they're ready to give up i promise you 
that that is the case. Keep calm and just start responding, but don't reacting. Start observing, but don't absorbing. Don't let them bait you. Don't let them trigger you. They go fishing and then they pull you in. And then once you're in, you're like, you're in the mud. You're down in it. Don't allow them because they're going to throw all kinds of things at you and see what sticks. And as soon as something sticks, then they've got you. The very first thing, stay calm. You can scream in the shower, cry in your pillow, whatever you need to do. But in front of them, don't allow them to bait you. Don't allow them to trigger you. All right, because anything you say or do is going to get used against you, just like getting arrested, right? They're looking for it. They're going to pounce on it. And the minute you react, the minute you do something, they're going to use it against you. And so remember, anything you put your hand to, anything you write, anything you hit post on, anything you set, hit send on is going to be a potential something, potential trial exhibit, you know, used uh, with your boss or whatever it is that, you know, your situation is, they're going to display it. They're going to show it. They're going to say, look, there's the crazy one. There's the one. They will use it against you. So be very, very careful about what you do. Stay calm, stay composed. I always say you want to be the good one. You want to be the one that stays and rises above. Remember, it, it really will serve you in the long run, right? So that's number one. Number two is you want to stay specific. You want to stay as specific as possible because vague accusations, broad sweeping things like always, never, not having details, that's what gets you in, into the weeds. So you want to have very, very specific details because it, the more specific you can be, the harder it is for them to squirm out of it. You know, if you can say, you know, you're late. Well, I'm not, I was never late. I was never late. Well, you know, you're always late. I'm always late. I'm always late. Well, I'm not always late. Well, but you were late. 87% of the time, you were late 87 times out of 100. Here's the evidence. Here's the backup. Here's the supporting documentation. The more you can do that, the more specifics that you have, the harder it is for them to, to weasel out of it. Okay? You want to reveal weaknesses to them. So you want to have as many specifics as you can in your particular situation, whatever it is, whether it's a work situation, whether it's a divorce or whatever it is situation that you've got. So if you're, if you're dealing with unprofessional behavior, have specifics. The more you can have concrete details, the better your situation is going to be. That's number two. Number three is using documented evidence. Documentation is going to be very, very crucial, especially when you're dealing with somebody who is out to get you. Keeping very, very thorough records is going to be your strongest ally in disproving false accusations. I can't stress this enough when you're dealing with this kind of a person because they never think you're going to keep track. Every little detail will end up being their downfall. And I've said this many, many times. For example, when a, a guy is saying, oh, I'm the best dad. All I want to do is be with my kids. And then he's constantly asking for a change in the schedule. Why you need to change the schedule 48 times out of 98 times in a four month period, if you want to be Mr. Dad, that makes you look bad. On the other hand, if mom is agreeable to it, well, then that makes her look good because especially if the statute says which parent is more likely to be fostering a close and continuing relationship with the other parent, that makes her look good. Those are the kinds of things, small details that seem insignificant that when you put them down and you've got supporting documentation, that they, they add up. But you don't know which thing is going to be the thing until you start keeping track of it all. Every time 
they ask for a change in the schedule or they don't show up on time or whatever it is that you're dealing with and it's maddening and it's frustrating, you just say to yourself, thank you for the gift. Thank you for the gift. That's what I always say. That's your reframe. You just keep track of it. The next thing is I do recommend that you have some sort of a third party who is either witnessing what you're doing, dealing, helping you deal with this or whatever. So whether it's a lawyer who's involved or who's watching what you're doing or who's involved so that you're not the only one who is seeing what's happening. Okay. So if there's an exchange of children or you are firing an employee or whatever it is, you need to have another set of eyes who's involved because they're always going to say, that's not how it happened. That's not what I did or whatever. So you want to have an added layer of protection to help you so that when they say, I didn't do that, that's not how it happened, that you've got somebody who can rebut their statement. And it's got to be somebody who really is a neutral third party and who's got some level of credibility. If you have a lawyer, that's helpful. If you have a mediator, that's helpful, depending on whatever your situation is. The next thing is to reverse the narrative. And what I mean by that is transforming a, an accusation into an opportunity to showcase your strength. What I mean by that is, let's say somebody is saying that you did something. And you know, like I've had situations before where I had a client who was accused of slashing somebody's tires, okay? And he slashed the, the tires of the wife because she was at her, the boyfriend's house in the middle of the night, you know, he was jealous and it was not a good thing. It was a bad fact. What happens with something like that is you've got to spin that. You've got to take that and out of the gate say, you know what? I did this thing that you're going to hear about how I slashed this guy's tires in the middle of the night. That was a bad thing that I did. My emotions got the best of me. I woke up in the middle of the night. I was so upset. I was so overcome by the fact that my wife was out in the middle of the night away from my children. And here I was tr trying to take care of everything. And I just, I couldn't get a hold of myself. And since then I've gone to anger management and I've done all of these things and I have gone to trauma therapy and I've become a so much better of a person as a result. And now this is the person that I am today as a result. And it was the worst thing that ever happened to me, but it's turned out to be the best thing that ever happened to me. And now I'm a so much of a stronger person. So you take that and you reverse the narrative because they're going to use it against you. So now you take it, you make it your own. The next thing is building a ca counter narrative. So creating a compelling positive narrative that overshadows the negative accusation. In other words, you want to now take those negative accusations that are going to be against you and make something that is so positive about yourself that all that negative stuff is just so ridiculous because you've got all kinds of other amazing things about yourself that are just, just seems so ridiculous that they're saying all these other things about you because here you are, you're this great mom, you're this great business person, or you're this fantastic guy. You're doing all these other fantastic things. The fact that they keep bringing up this one thing is just so ridiculous. For example, I had a guy one time, the wife kept bringing up that the husband might have a drinking problem. And all she, she could come up with was that he walked out of a store holding a six pack while he didn't even have the son. And, but in the meantime, he was this great dad. 
He took his son to baseball. He was coaching the baseball team. He was at family dinners every Sunday with his family. He was volunteering to coach the son on his baseball team. He was the head coach. I mean, he did all these other fantastic things. And the only thing that you could come up with was that he was walking out of the store carrying a six pack. I mean, and so all these other things was just sh overshadowing. He built a, a counter narrative. And by the way, if this is resonating with you so far, give me a yes in the chat so far. I wanna hear from you. Give me a yes in the chat because these are the best responses to false accusations and this is how you win. This is how you win your court case. This is how you win any kind of a situation when you are dealing with your accusers. All right, give me a yes if this is helpful. And if you are dealing with this, make sure that you join my free private Facebook group, Narcissist Negotiators with Rebecca Zung. We're gonna drop links to all of this below because we wanna make sure that you have the support and help that you need. Strategy seven, seven is emotional mastery. You gotta control your emotions to make sure that you are perceived as the credible one. You are perceived as the composed one. You don't wanna be the one that's like the crazy one because they're gonna to try to make sure that you are, okay? And this is part of my slay program. For those of you who do not have my slave program, why do you not? It's like the best thing on the freaking planet because in my slave program, I've got all kinds of things like my personalized GPT prompt and, and how to find hidden assets and income and all sorts of amazing things. But one of the things in here I talk about is subpoenas, using subpoenas instead of direct discovery requests. Okay, because you don't want to do that. Subpoenas can help you so much because if you're waiting for them to just hand you 12 months of bank statements, for example, what are they going to do? They're going to give you every month except July, or they're going to give you all the months except for page 12 or whatever. And you're going to end up trying to file a motion to compel and then try to get fees out of them and whatever else. And it's just a, a bunch of game playing constantly. And then you finally set the hearing and then they give you everything the night before, but you, did, you already incurred the fee. And it's just a constant madness. But if you just go and do the subpoenas, then you can get more comprehensive information than you can with direct requests for discovery. And, and you just get the information directly. And while it seems like it could be more expensive, it's actually way less headache and way more efficient and usually less expensive, okay? So if you have a situation where you can get the financial records directly from the bank or from the businesses or from the credit card companies or whatever, I highly recommend that you do that. Next is employing private detectives when appropriate, if you can, if you can get them you know, somewhat reasonably priced, if you know exactly what you're looking for and you know for sure that there is something that you're going to dig up and get. I do not recommend that you do this if you're just, you know, willy-nilly, you know, spending money. It's just a, a, a mission to just, you know, figure out what they're doing just to figure it out. You know, this is really to get information on assets or a business partnership. You've got to figure out what you're, this is for, okay? The next thing is your last one, which is one of my favorites, one of my favorites, you know, I'm half Chinese. I always wear jade, always wear jade because I'm half Chinese, but never jade, never justify, argue, defend, or explain. Never, never, never. Because you end up in these futile debates that validate their narrative. Pulls you, you're pulled in, sucked in, drawn in, and then here you are. So, and, and then you've never heard a narcissist go, wow. You really convinced me. I'm so, I, I really, like, I'm on your side now. It doesn't happen. My ex over there, forget about getting them to see your side. Forget about closure and forget about being acknowledged by them. Like, it, it's not, those are the things that aren't going to happen. Employing these strategies will help you tremendously. If you don't have my free Crush My Negotiation prep playbook, please get that. It's totally free. Get it at winmynegotiation.com. It will help you tremendously to get started. What if you could just take a shot 
and lose all the weight you wanted to. I know for me, a few years ago, I was dealing with thyroid issues, menopause issues, autoimmune issues, all the things, and I gained a bunch of weight and I lost it all, but it took forever. And I wish that something like Row Body had been around back then to help me lose the weight. But now you get the benefit of it because Row Body is now around to help you lose weight. It's just one shot a week, and combined with a healthy lifestyle, you can lose 15 to 20% of your weight in a year on average and actually keep it off. They've helped more than 200,000 people so far, and they help you even with support, with getting the medication through your insurance and everything that you need so that you can actually lose the weight. That means that it's such a great opportunity for you now. So average weight loss is 15 to 20% in a year with a healthy lifestyle change and BMI and other eligibility criteria apply. Go to ro.co slash Rebecca. Sign up today and you'll pay just $99 a month for your first month and $145 a month after that. And medication costs are separate. That's ro.co slash Rebecca. Confronting narcissists and court demands a dual approach. You really need unshakable evidence and you need a psychological acumen as well as really the skill uh, of a really good lawyer in cross-examination or if you are going to be doing it on your own you really know how you, you need to know how to do cross-examination yourself in a really skillful way having that really good evidence is the the beginning of it that leverage all right and that's what i talk about in my slay approach that strategy, that leverage. So let's start from the beginning here, okay? So evidence. Narcissists are masters at manipulation. They paint themselves either as victims or as heroes usually. And you're counter, well, that undeniable tangible evidence, but it's how are you going to present it? So it's not just here are the facts, but you've got to present it in a way, you've got to tell the story that's really going to lead the judge to the conclusion that you need the judge to come to. And that's really, really the key. You've got to tell that story. And that's the skill that comes in when you're presenting this evidence. Because here's the thing, all narcissists lie. All narcissists basically hand you everything that you need. They all are having text messages, emails, all sorts of things. They have inconsistent statements that are, it, they make it very, very easy for you. But you've got to tell the story. You've got to be the one that goes through all of this and finds these twisted facts and puts it together. You've got to put together this comprehensive dossier of evidence in a way that threads it all together, that tells the story in the way that you need the judge to hear. Let's say, for example, that it's a custody case that you are, are arguing. What you want to do is you want to say, okay, here is the custody statute. The custody statute has Let's say it has 10 factors in it. You've got to actually start to go, all right, here are the 10 different factors that I'm going to be arguing with, but how do I thread them together in a way that tells the story that I want to tell? Well, let's say one of the factors is which parent is more likely to maintain a, a consistent relationship with the other parent to actually want to have a relationship with the other parent. Well, you know that you've got a text message that says, well, this other parent is wicked or this other parent is toxic or this other parent should drop dead or whatever it is. Well, that's a good piece of evidence for you. So you're going to use that. Or let's say that you have a whole host of times when you've got, let's say it was 98 different times that you were supposed to have exchanges, but 48 of those times, the other parent asked for a change in the schedule. 
Well, then that shows that that other parent wasn't a consistent parent. That actually helps you. That helps you to, to look like you're the more consistent parent. So that is a great summary that you can actually use. Summaries of lies, summaries of inconsistent evidence, all sorts of things. Once you start to put them together and thread them together, it actually starts to look like now you're putting together facts instead of actually painting them as something and you're just coming in and saying that person's a narcissist you can actually thread together real evidence that is backed up by texts by emails by journals by financial documents by witness statements, things like that, that actually will matter to the judge. Now you've got all of that together. You use that on your own direct examination. The next thing you do is you go into cross-examination, all right? So you've got your own direct examination where you actually sit and you speak to the things that you found. And now you go into cross-examination. Cross-examination is a crucial battleground because now you're actually trying to say why what they're saying actually has no merit. You're trying to discredit what they're saying. Now you're actually saying, you know what, you're actually a liar. And this is actually like mental chess. This is actually like psychological stuff. The way that you kind of get at them is you get them to admit to lies or you get them to repeat statements or you show them what you have compiled. But isn't it true that you said this? But isn't it true that this is what happened? What you want them to do is you want them to only answer yes or no statements. You don't want them to answer in long form sentences. Isn't it true that this is what happened? Yes. Isn't it true that this is what happened? Yes, all right? You don't want them to go into long form statements. Let their lawyer come back and clarify if need be. But you want them to get tangled up in their own falsehoods, in their own lies. You want them to reveal their contradictions and erode their credibility in the eyes of the court. That's why you try to keep them to short statements. And, and you really should never ask a question on cross-examination that you don't already know the answer to, all right? That's one of the absolutes on cross-examination. And understanding their psyche is really, really key in cross-examination. And that's one of your secret weapons in cross-examination. So one of the things that you should do is always depose them ahead of time because many times you will get them to lie on deposition and then you can expose the lie in court as well, especially if there are inconsistencies or there's inconsistencies on something that they said in a sworn document such as a financial affidavit or something like that. Always aim to figure out where you can get them on cross-examination in court and then methodically expose those inconsistencies one at a time on cross-examination, juxtaposing them against irrefutable evidence one answer at a time. That way you can not only discredit their story, but also rattle them. Get them to lead them to emotional outbursts. If you can lead them to an emotional outburst, then you've got that because that will further weaken their stance. You're going to remember to defeat narcissists every single time to knock them dead. D-E-A-D-D. Because you want to make sure they're really dead. So an extra D on the end. So the first D is to document everything. You want to make sure that you're taking care of 
every little, little detail. That means you are keeping track of every text, keeping track of every email, keeping track of when they're late, when they're early, when they didn't show up on time, every single thing, because you know, when you're dealing with a narcissist in negotiations, it's worse than getting arrested, right? Everything you do and say is going to be used against you. Even if they're pretending like, oh, I want to keep this amicable. That's always a trick because with a narcissist, you're either for them or against them. And if you're against them, then you become public enemy number one. Even if they know deep down inside that they shouldn't be acting like that. They cannot help themselves because they don't trust you. They don't trust themselves. They don't trust anybody. Everybody's an enemy. Remember, they lie all the time. They lie even if they don't need to lie. They lie about things that are readily, readily verifiable. They're constantly looking for that way to get that narcissistic supply. And part of the way that they get supply, don't forget, is manipulating you, seeing you squirm. It's about that game, right? Making sure that you're documenting everything that's happening is going to be very, very important. If you ask them for a schedule change and they said no, they asked you for a schedule change, you know, with the kids and you said yes, document that because those kinds of things can become very good trial exhibits down the road. How many times were you agreeable and how many times were they agreeable you, or not agreeable? Great leverage down the road, all right? So documenting everything, making sure that you're keeping unrelated parties updated about the situation, you know, because you don't know who might be uh, ending up to be a good witness for you down the road as well. Keeping track of financial documents, of photographs, of audio tapes, videotapes, every single thing, because you don't know down the road, patterns end up being good leverage. That's number one of your D. That's your D. Attention to all of you who have ever felt trapped by a narcissist. Are you struggling in a relationship with a narcissist and feeling powerless or paranoid and not sure what to do? It is time to take back control and flip the script on their game. I want to introduce to you the ultimate solution to breaking free from the grip of narcissistic manipulation. Join me for a groundbreaking webinar called The Three Must-Have Secrets to Communicating with a Narcissist. Hi, my name is Rebecca Zung, and I've been recognized by U.S. News as one of the best lawyers in America, and I'm a globally recognized narcissist negotiation expert, and I've spent years studying and mastering the art of negotiating with narcissists. I know firsthand the devastation these relationships can cause, but I also know the key to regaining your power, and I know how to shift the dynamic with these high conflict personalities. In this exclusive webinar, you will discover the three essential secrets to go from feeling paralyzed and feeling like a victim to becoming victorious. This isn't just theory. These are proven techniques that I have used to help literally thousands of people go from feeling powerless to feeling victorious and actually breaking free from the grip of narcissistic control. Hi, my name is Heather, and I have never felt so compelled to give a review as I do now for attorney Rebecca Zung. The strength I had gained and the confidence that I had gained from Rebecca actually allowed me to get a different self-worth and presence in myself. And due to that, I was actually able to pick myself up within, made tremendous difference. And, you know, she has literally changed the situation for me and mostly given me a sense of presence, strength, self-confidence, and well-being that um, I'm just so grateful 
for her. Hi, I'm Dr. Joe Vitale. I know Rebecca Zung. She interviewed me, but I'm also aware of all of her products. What she's doing is saving people who are going through the dark night of the soul. This can be the turning point for you. Don't let that narcissist have that grip on your life any longer. It's time to rewrite your history and take charge of your future and unlock that power within you. Sign up now for three must-have secrets to communicating with narcissists and embark on a transformational journey toward your freedom, toward your empowerment. Break free from the grasp of that narcissist and create the life that you deserve. Join me, attorney Rebecca Zung, narcissist negotiation expert, and let's rewrite your narrative together. Register now at slay.rebeccazung.com and let's take the first step toward your life of victory. Now let's go to E, which is emotions keeping them in check. They will definitely come after you and look for that Achilles heel. They're going to look for ways to get you under your skin, to get you upset, to trigger you in some way, because that's how they get their jollies. Remain calm no matter what. Don't show any emotion. You know, you've heard that expression, gray rock. I mean, you can show them compassion. You can show them dignity. You can kill them with kindness. No matter what they say to you, you can be like, oh, I know. I see you. I get it. Oh, that's wonderful. Can I get you some cookies? You know, whatever. I mean, you can just be as lovely as possible. I mean, when faced with accusations, slander, lies, you never confirm, you never deny, you just pretend like you're reporting the news, you just looking at them. Oh, yes, I see that you just said that. You know, that's that's very interesting feedback that you just mentioned to me. I mm, I heard what you just said. Ambiguity is your best friend. You know, you don't say anything. You don't give any kind of emotional nothing. The more you can just stay out of that, then the, the better it's going to be for you because they're looking for that rise. They're looking to get you hooked in. They go fishing and they go baiting, baiting you in. And then they use your reactions against you. And as long as they're getting supply, they're never going to leave you alone. That's number two is the E, you know, so knock, knocking them dead. D E is emotions. Keep them in in check, no matter what. Then next is A, always wear that white hat. So hard. You feel like it's not fair because as you're moving toward court, you feel like, oh my gosh, they're getting away with everything. But let me tell you, there's no getting away with because it's not until you get to court that things actually happen. It's not like there's little fairies that jump out into your living room and go, hey, you're not allowed to do that. So it, it, you have to understand that you have to wear that white hat until you get to a place where it actually matters. While you're waiting for that time, you have to let them do what they're going to do. And yes, it doesn't feel fair or no, it doesn't feel fair, whatever. I don't know how you say that, but they're going to do the things that they're going to do. You make your documented attempts to resolve issues. You know, you allow them to reject you. You allow them to stonewall you. It just serves as your good faith attempts to try to settle. You know, you allow them to make accusations against you and you can just say, I mean, you can say that's not true if you want to or whatever, but I wouldn't get too deep into it. Don't defend yourself. Don't explain. Don't justify. Don't get into the mud because then they're sucking you in. I would just allow them to say whatever they want. Don't allow them to probe you. Don't allow them to get into it with you. Uh, I would just wear that white hat. You know, when they, when they start saying things and, and lobbing their accusations, 
let them lose the battles to win the war turn the other cheek make it look like you are above reproach keep yourself high because what happens is is the judge will just see two people fighting otherwise you're just as bad as the other one but if the judge sees that one person has been the good one and the other person has been the bad one it makes it a whole lot easier to figure out who's the one that they're not going to like. And, you know, underneath those robes, they're human beings and they make choices about who's the one that they can believe and who's the one that they can't. So they're looking to see while they read those messages in our family wizard or whatever who's the one that always said kind things who's the one that always agreed to change it who's the one that was always the good one so always wear the white hat and i have a whole video on how narcissists sabotage their own lives you can check it out it's called how covert narcissists sabotage their own lives i would highly recommend that you check it out and i also recommend that you get my 15 page free ebook, which is at winmynegotiation.com. It's a crush my negotiation prep worksheet. It will help you win your negotiation. So many people have won their entire negotiations just on that. So grab that at winmynegotiation.com. And remember, don't go crazy with asking for stuff that makes you look bad with the judge either, you know? I mean, you want to make sure that what you ask for is comports with the law. And again, you're wearing that white hat. You know, you, you walk that straight and narrow path, all right? You know, you don't want to look antagonistic. You don't want to look like the bully. You don't want to look like you're the one who is just as bad let them make their own bet, right? So that is the A, D-E-A. Now the first D in knock them dead. That is don't go anywhere alone. They're going to look for reasons to try to frame you. They're going to look for reasons to try to make you look bad. So I would definitely try to have witnesses around you as many times as you can, even with your deposition, by the way, if you're going to be deposed, they pull antics. A lot of times, depending on the kind of narcissist that you're dealing with, they make faces, they try to bait you into doing things that emotionally trigger you, that sort of thing. So if you have the extra bucks, I would do a video deposition if you have the money to do that, because you know, you want to just keep them in check if you can. And you want to stay away from giving them opportunities to create false allegations, especially, you know, depending on how crazy emotional they are, they will say, oh, you know, they said this, they did that, whatever. You don't want those to give them those opportunities to the best of your ability. I wouldn't, you know, be alone with them. Right. And by the way, you know, if you need additional support, get the help and support that you need. Make sure you have therapy, you have a friend group, you have people around you who can support you. If you need additional support, make sure you join my free private Facebook group, Narcissist Negotiators with Rebecca Zong. If you need additional help with therapy, we have a sponsor on this channel, which is BetterHelp. You can go to betterhelp.com forward slash Rebecca Zung. We receive commissions on that because they are a sponsor on this channel. You don't pay any extra for that. We just want you to have access to help and support that you can trust. The last D is decoy. Decoy. Why I say this is you never let go of your leverage. You never get let go of what your, your offer is going to be. You never tell them anything unless until you are ready to tell them what your best evidence is going to be, what your anything else, you just keep them thrown off the scent. And honestly, I wouldn't tell them what it is that you really want ever, you know, even at the end of the deal, when it seems like you got what you wanted. I would just, you know, do your best Meryl Streep or Al Pacino or whatever it is. And, oh my God, I can't believe they got that. Oh, that's terrible. Whatever. And, and, you know, if you got exactly what you wanted, great. Take your ego out of it. Let them think they want. So what? Move on because you can move on with your life and be happy that you're done. 
Okay. Because if you can feign ignorance, you know, nothing, have nothing, let them suspect nothing. And then you got this, you can move on. You've got freedom. I want you to put that in the comments right now. I got this because you do, you got this and you can do this. You're the smarter one. They're not very good with this because their emotions rule them and you, you can be better than this. Put that in the comments right now. I got this. I got this. The weaker you appear, it'll encourage their, their aggression and their arrogance or whatever. It'll work to your advantage. Don't show your hand. You know, you can even, you know, maybe throw them off with some, some bad information. Oh, this is the thing that I really want. Because if you do that, then, you know, they'll go after that, whatever thing that is, it is that you don't actually want. You know that they're irrational. So expect that they will be irrational. Be surprised if they're not, but don't be lulled when they act rational and normal because you know how they are. Those are just some of the ways that's how to knock them dead. B-E-A-D-D. -D. If you do these things, it will help you. It will help you ambush them. It'll help you get what you want in court and it'll help you be fully prepared for that fight and it'll help you have that power that you want and show the judge who the more powerful one is. The more that you can show that you are the stronger one, the more that you can show that you're capable, the more that you can become the most powerful version of yourself, that is authentic power. Narcissists are never going to have authentic power because they stand in power that's based on a lie and power that's based on a lie is not real power. But what you're creating now is power that's based in something that's real. And, and you're creating some of a, re, a, a resilience that is stronger than anything. And you're becoming the best version of yourself. And just remember that.